If you've been following along with us, uh, we're reading through 2 Samuel, and I'd like to give an overview of 2 Samuel. I tend to do a longer overview of the sermons, uh, of the Bible passage that we've been reading. We have a goal this year that together as a community, we want to read through the Bible, we want to read through God's Word. Hey, come in, brother. <laughs> we met last week. <laughs> um, and, and reading through the Bible is because we know that as a community, uh, there's different ways to, to build a church community. What we believe one of the best ways to build church community so that each person will grow is be centered upon the Word of God. Preaching the Word, studying the Word, applying the Word to our, our lives. And this is the best way for Christians to grow. Besides that, you need to pray, you need to worship God, and you need to have fellowship. Fellowship with the believers, the Bible tells us that we should especially take care of each other. And that's one of the key some signs that people who are not Christian can determine where, is, where are the true disciples of Jesus Christ. One of the places that we can see that true discipleship happens is when the believers take care of each other, pray for each other, have fellowship, they are concerned about each other. But that's where it starts. So it starts first with us being concerned about each other, the love of God, woohoo, fills us up, yeah. and that pours out to every other person we see. And so we believe that one of the best ways to stimulate that, to help that to, that to happen, is to actually be centered around the Bible teaching and preaching the Word of God. So that's what we always ask you, that if you have your Bible, have your Bible with you, because you always want to be a good student of the Bible, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, you should always expect that every person in cross-culture who stands here at the microphone and teaches from God's Word, teaches from God's Word. It's not their opinion. It's not, you know, with some other group of people come up to, but we try to be really centered upon trying to, to the best of our ability, to the best of our understanding, to communicate the truth that's from God's Word. So that's why we always ask if people have a Bible. If you have a Bible, follow along. Second Samuel. Well, we can start there. <coughs> Second Samuel is pretty much about the life of King David. And, and earlier, you guys already heard this sermon, but earlier um, in the, the beginning of Second Samuel, um, it sets up David, who becomes anointed as the king of Israel. Saul doesn't seem to like him that much. David has this thing. David is a leader. And as a, a person who happens to have the ability or the, the privilege of leading God's people, I felt like this text this week really spoke a lot about us as individuals. Um, because it really talks about a person named David. And, and if you feel that your life is like just not everything God wants it to be. You're not the best speaker. Uh, you keep messing up. You want to follow God's word. You want to do what God says. But, you know, kind of mess up. Then studying the life of King David, because David's a very important figure. Uh, David's important because that he's, he's one of the forerunners, one of the shadows of the Messiah. He's also the lineage where the Messiah would come through. He's also the one that if you read through Kings, first and second Kings, God is always comparing the kings to David. And you're like, wait a minute. David had a whole bunch of wives. I'm just going to talk about his problems right now. Uh, David, when he was time to go out to battle, he, the Bible we can read later on, he sees this naked woman, Bathsheba, on the rooftop. Uh -huh. He's like, oh, baby, woo. Uh, he gets her to come over to his house. He's like, I'm King David. She's like, woo, the king. And they make enter into an adulterous affair. They have a baby. And then David goes, oh, I've got to do something about this. And so what he does is that he goes and he has her husband, who is at the end of 2 Samuel. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not going to be that excited today. I'm trying to it's my new style. But anyway, at the end of 2 Samuel, what happens is that the Bible makes a comment about Uriah. And if we can turn really quickly to the very last, to the very end of 2 Samuel, and it talks about the mighty men of, of David. It talks about that there are a certain group of men who are always with David. Wherever David, wherever David was at, there was a group of other leaders, a group of other people who helped him to accomplish the vision that God has placed inside of his heart. David is not a lone wolf. He is not a lone reader, a leader. He has people around him all the time. And the Bible talks about the mighty man of David. Um, in chapter 23, um, at the very end of chapter 23, it names this guy, verse 39, Uriah the Hittite. One of 37 and all. Uriah the Hittite. You know who he is? He's the husband of Bathsheba. 
the woman who David had an adulterous affair with. And, and, and he is so loyal. He is so much of a leader that when he comes home and David is trying every trick he had in the book, he tries to get him drunk. Now Bathsheba must have been pretty good looking because David just assumed, if I'm talking to that, you have to wave your hands because I do not want to get excited. But when David, when Uriah comes home, David summons him, summons him from the battlefield and Uriah comes home and David's like, go to your wife. That's Sheba. She's woo. She's all that. Come on, you've been away for a long time. Just go in, have some fun. Be a man. Uh -huh. you know, if he was a basketball player, he would have slapped him uh -huh. behind him. Just, and David would have gone in. And, all right. I mean, the Uriah would have gone in. And he says, nah, not why my men are still out in the field. Or we're still fighting your enemies. Okay. Now, this is a person after God's own heart. This is a person who writes the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And this is the King David, slayer of Goliath. Takes a stone, boom, to his head, down on the ground. This is David, the awesome one. And he's like, huh, that didn't work. And could you just like imagine like if this was like before the age of documentary soap operas? This would have been like episode two. What happens to David? You turn back to the next show, next week, you're like, oh, what is he going to do? David's like, I've got to come up with a plan. I know. I'll get him drunk. So he goes and he tells her, come to my house. We're going to have a party. Woo woo. It's best, you know, it's party time at the king's house. And he gets a ride drunk and he's like, go to your wife. Stops on the party again. Go there. What happens? No, he doesn't do it. He sleeps outside. He won't sleep in the I mean, Uriah, and David's just like frustrated. So what he does is that he gives a letter to Uriah to give to Joab. And then the letter, he has a sealed letter from the king. And that sealed letter says that when Uriah comes, put him in the forefront, in the very heat of the battle, and then withdraw from him. Now, loyalty is something that the Bible talks about a lot of times. When we, when we, today in the service here in the Church of Sweden, we read about, about Peter. We all know that during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, Peter, he denies Jesus, right? He says, I'm not, I'm not one of those. And he swears, he jumps up and down, and he makes a big noise about it. Do we all feel like, whoa, Peter, all right, woohoo, you let Jesus down. You right. denied Jesus. Do we all feel like that was a good thing? Okay, good. I was really afraid someone was going to raise their hand. Yeah. Okay, so that was a bad thing because disloyalty is not good. It's better to just, just to say, I don't want to be a part of your team, I'm going to leave your team, but disloyalty is so bad. But Uriah is so loyal to David. And even though he's a Hittite, and you have to understand that the, the Hittites were this group of people that they have like this total immoral religious system. They were not known for being goodly, godly people. They were like really bad. But, but sometimes, as we read through the story, in the Old Testament, and as you're reading through the story, I really want you to be aware of the fact that many of the times, God is bringing other people, not just Jewish people, in. not just the physical descendants of Abraham, but there's people like a Rahab. She wasn't a Hebrew. Ruth, she, she's got a whole book of the Bible. She wasn't a Hebrew. God uses and he draws people to anyone who seems to want to come to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God seems to be always ready. Like He wasn't just waiting for Jesus to die on a cross. God has always been about grace and mercy. And anyone who wants to repent and anyone who wants to come, can come. And of the mighty man of God, Uriah, is one of Uriah gives the letter to Joab. He goes out to the field. He gets killed. And at the very end, in verse 39, and it talks about all the brave men who were loyal to David, all the brave men who were faithful, all the brave men who helped him to accomplish the vision that God has placed inside of his heart. And the last name on the list, verse 39, chapter 23, Uriah the Hittite, 37 and all. Because these mighty men were, mind you, go to verse 8 in chapter 23. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb Bas Bashebeth, oh, I can't even say what it is, a, a Tachemonite. He, he was chief of the three. He welded his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. Is he not bad? Uh, who is Spider Man? Who is Iron Man? This guy was super tough. Now, he was the leader of the main three 
who were like better than all the other mighty men. But in that group of mighty men, well, the, the mighty men were so so crazy because like one day David is, is running away from Saul and is in the heat of battle and David's thirsty and he says, ah, you know, I really like to have a glass of water. The mighty men break through the lines of the enemy, beating everyone down, gets the water, brings it back to David. And David's probably shocked. He probably didn't, he probably didn't really mean like he says, because I know some leaders, not me, but some leaders have a tendency to joke around a lot and say things, and everyone's like, that guy's never serious. Like, you would kind of know that, but maybe David wasn't that kind of a person, and so he thought he was serious about needing the water. And they bring him back the water, that peril for their own life, and David pours it out. The Bible says that he pours it out to the Lord. To the Lord. These were the mighty men of David. It, at, earlier in that, they talk about how these mighty men um, had defeated all the crazy giants. Uh, so the Philistines go on, they make war against Israel. Uh, let's see, which one do I have that at? I forgot to mark it. Yeah. Um, chapter 21. Starting in verse 15. There was war again between the Philistines and Israel. And David went down together with his servants, and they fought against the Philistines. And David grew weary. And Ishbi ben Og, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze, and who was armed with a new sword, fought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, You shall no longer go, go out with us to battle, lest you quench the, the lamp of Israel. Sometimes as a leader, you have a season. There's a season when you're at your best. There's a season when you're most passionate and you're on fire. But God puts around you, if you're smart, you will always have around you other people who can speak truth into your life. You always allow people to tell you the hard things that's hard to digest, hard to take in. Uh, David has this person that we can read earlier in the chapter, earlier in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 2 Samuel. He has a prophet named Nathan. And when David sins against Bathsheba and thinks now that Uriah is dead, everything is okay. Nathan dares to come before the king who has the power of life and death to inform the king that it's not all hidden and that God is bringing us all up into the open. David at that point, because if he's a, a bad leader, when you're confronted with your shortcomings and your sin, what you tend to do is you want to silence the voice of truth. So say like, um, I don't know, me and Eunice were having an affair. I don't know why I just happened to see Eunice. He looks so very cute over there. So we say like, so Eunice is married to Lynn, I'm married to Lynette, but for some reason, me and Eunice have decided to have an affair. Ooh, we're having a good time. <laughs> no one knows about it. We're having our secret men's meeting together, and no one knows about it. And, but Anna Carden, who happens to be Eunice's uh, sister, is, she's, she's my friend, and so she's allowed as a sister in Christ, we have this great relationship and she can speak truth into my life. Mm. And all of a sudden Anna Karin says, you know, I went to my brother's house and I found these videos and it don't look so good and I think you're in unison doing something you shouldn't be doing. Now, the bad leader would say, huh, you're a student yourself. You know what, Anna Karin, the bad person, let's get rid of her with stoner. Or at least kick her out of the church. Because, because you always want to hide from the truth. But a good leader owns up to the wrong that they do. We turn to the living God and ask God for, for help. Ask God to forgive. Ask God to help him to break that chain, that binding with that particular sin. Uh, we can read about that. So keep your finger here on chapter 21. 21. Just so you know I'm not making things up. And we'll, we'll go back a few more chapters here. <clears throat> chapter 12. And it says here in, in verse 1 in chapter 12, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, uh, which he had brought. And he, and he brought it up, and he grew up with him and with his children. <coughs> he used to eat his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. He was like a daughter to him. When I first read that, I thought that was really weird, but then my daughter has a naked cat, and she's always taking pictures, and she like sleeps with a naked cat. It's like a rat. It's so disgusting. 
And now she's into this bird. And so she's got this little bird. And she's playing with this bird. And she's like, oh, my little birdie, boy. So I guess that sometimes some people have their the animals that they help to raise. They get really close to them. And they're like a child. That's this, this lamb. Nathan paints a picture. And here's this lamb, and he's grown up, and he fed the lamb from his own food and treats it like a daughter mm-hmm. who goes around and says, bad, all the time. Mm-hmm. Now, there came a traveler, verse 4, there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock and herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he has no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your, and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you of your own house, And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who was born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. This is probably one of the most one of the most riveting stories that we have in the Bible. Here's a person exalted by God. And God brings us up before David. And as David, through the prophet Nathan, as, as David is now confronted by his sin, God makes a point to David. It's not by your strength. It is not by your military prowess. It's not anything by you. I have lifted you up. And to every single person, wherever you're at in life, your life is in the hand of God. It is God who lifts you up. It is God who has your future in His hand. It is always the the Lord God Almighty. There is no one else. You owe Him your life. You owe Him your allegiance. You owe Him everything. There is nothing that you have. Your intelligence, your job, your prosperity, your lack of prosperity, everything is in the hand of the Lord God Almighty. And when God so chooses that at a certain season of life, He lifts you up, He blesses you, He gives you these things. And God says to him, if that wasn't enough, if just being the king of Israel and Judah was not enough, I would have added that much more. Like everything that God had blessed him with, God would have added that much more to him. But God's indictment of David is that you have scorned me. See, to scorn someone is first that you've had to have the person in, in high esteem. Almost like you love the person. You have to be really dedicated. And then when you turn away, you scorn them. When you no longer value what they say and what they do, when you no longer have the same kind of vision towards a person, you scorn them. Husbands can scorn their wives. Wives can scorn their husbands. Friends can scorn each other. But in this case, God says, you have scorned me. See, God has done nothing but good towards David. And God says, it is I who have delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I don't know if you've ever sinned so great in your life that you thought that maybe your salvation was at stake, or maybe you thought your relationship or closeness to God was at stake. A part of being a a pastor is the fact of of listening to other people and, and walking with them through their pain and their falling, or myself, having to seek the counsel of another pastor for my own shortcomings in life. And to, and to stand there and to know that, that with that sin, that you, you wish you could take it back. Mm-hmm. You wish you could roll the camera back and you could just not have done it. You, you, you wish you could have just gone to yourself, like gone out of yourself and to yourself and then slap yourself in the face and say, stop it, stupid! Mm-hmm. But you're standing there totally ashamed not 
so much because of what other people say, but because of how God is now looking over your life. The God who's been good to you, the God who's blessed you, the God who's walked with you, the God who's called you, the God who's saved you, the God who's always there for you and never turns his back from you. And now God looks with that. My, my grandfather was a, was a pastor. My grandfather was a very, uh, my dad's side, he was a very kind person. I come from a, a, a time and period, I was born in the 60s in America, corporal punishment. Bam! Take the belt off, psh, right on the butt, okay? Mm -hmm. But I tell you, one day I lied to my grandfather. Because I don't know, sometimes I just thought my family hated me, so I decided I was going to run away from home. So I hid in the basement, and no one could find me. And I'm going to run away from home now. And my family's out looking for me, and they finally find me because... I'm a dumb kid, and I didn't get that far, <laughs> but I thought I was going to get that far. My grandfather sits me down, and he says, you know, Edward, you are my first grandchild. You carry my name. I never thought that I would ever be disappointed. I never thought that you would ever hurt me so much to make me be so worried to think that maybe something bad has happened to you. Even to this day, that is hard for me to take in. Because my grandfather's always been good to me. Always been kind. His, he was strong, he was a big guy, he was worked with construction. And his strength was never ever used to intimidate, to hurt, to put down, but it was always there to protect and to stand up for anyone who did not have a voice. And this is a time when black people in America didn't have a lot of power or authority or anything, and, and he stood for something that was greater because he believed that there was a God that he had to answer before, and there was a God who washed over his life, there was a God who gave his life meaning, and he was not about to walk away to the right or to the left from God. I would have rather for my grandfather to have taken off his belt and spanked me. A good one. Go out to the peach tree and get the peach switch. To... Then to hear those words and to see that disappointment in his eyes. And I believe that as David is hearing this, you know, David who, I, this is so amazing because so many times you're reading that, that David's about to go out to battle. Who's he turned to? He says, God, will you deliver this people? Will you deliver the Philistines into my hand? And God says, do this or do that. David's like, okay. The same David that when, when Goliath, the giant, stands there and he's talking and he's taunting all Israel and all the other soldiers are all afraid. And David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? And David takes a stone and Goliath says, what is this dog? And David says, you may call me a dog, but I come to you today in the name and the strength of the Lord of Israel. I mean, you understand? It's not like David didn't know God. It's not like God wasn't there for David. But these words, and, and the thing is that David doesn't stand there like many people do, which go, well, you know, I mean, you know, in my example, it was Eunice's fault. If he didn't wear those tight jeans like that, you know, and have that blue or blonde hair, you know, if he didn't come from Sveg, because you know the hot guys come from Sveg, you know, I would have never been tempted, God. I hope I'm not embarrassing you with us. <laughs> Good, and then I can lay it on. Then, <laughs> you know, and, and, Blame it on him. No. Or well, if Anna Carl was really my friend, she would have kept me from sitting a long time ago. What kind of fake friends? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we're confronted by the truth, we want to blame other people. But in this, in this story, first that David's righteousness, he's all worked up. How could someone do this? And now they, that mirror that all of us need to face sometimes. Because we all, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, 23, we will all sin and come short of the glory of God. It says that God looks from heaven to see if there's anyone who does good, and there's no one that does that. Everyone goes in their own way. So there's none of us that are so perfect or righteous that we could look down upon another person. There's none of us that are so all that that we can think that we're better. And sometimes we have to be confronted by the mirror of our own sin and distance and brokenness before God. And it's, it's just so... Heart-wrenching way. I mean, listen to the words of God again. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's wife's house and your master's wives. I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? That's 
point we're all at. Before God's law, we're all there. See, it's not God's law that's the biggest problem. It's not other people around me. It is my heart just does not want to always, in every situation, in every time, in every category of my life, bow before the God and do it His way. I cannot honestly, regardless of how long I've walked with Him, can say that in every situation, I've held His word so high that I've been willing to die for His word rather than to sin. But I tell you, that's just not me. I wish I was that person. I wish I could say that, no, I've come so far in my faith. I'm just like perfect. I never do anything wrong. I never lose my temper. I never get mad. I never say bad things about people. I never, you know, gossip behind people's back. I'm never envious. I'm never jealous. I am, you know, I'm just so righteous. Wish you guys would be that righteous. But these words could be easily applied to me. And I believe they could be easily applied to you. But something happens. David acknowledges his sin. I have sinned against the Lord. He doesn't blame it on Bathsheba. He doesn't. This is, if you guys understand, often men who are caught in an affair are usually blaming it on the woman. But what David says is that it's all about him. He takes his personal responsibility before God and the relationship he has with God. And then Nathan says, The Lord has also put away your sin. If you turn really quickly, because I have to end soon, I don't know how I forgot to set my timer, so I don't know how long it's been, because, you know, I just didn't have a timer. If you turn really quickly to Psalms chapter 51. A psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went, went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So, this is the very psalm that David writes after, Nathan, after the prophet Nathan confronts him with his sin. After he gets to hear that God has acknowledged that David has confessed his sin and, that, and God has taken away his, his sin. He's not going to kill him for this. He could, but he decides not to. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with his up, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the bones that you have broken rejoice. That is a person in that brokenness who does not turn away from God and does not run away from God, but runs to God. If you're caught in sin somewhere, if you're caught in a bad behavior, if you're caught in something in your life, you know that God does not want you to do with that. Do not run from God, but run to God. Throw yourself into the mercy and the grace of God and let God deal with you. Let him, let him, in that brokenness of your heart, let you also experience God's forgiveness. Let you experience God's mercy and God's grace towards you. Because God always still has good intentions. And He takes the bad that's in our life, as it says in Romans chapter 8, and He turns the bad around and He works it out for the good. Because only God can take rotten meat and make a buffet and banquet out of it. None of us can, but God can. And so do not let you know, the sin that, that creeps into your life or the sin that takes over your life keep you away from the living God, but turn to God. Run to God. Turn yourself into God and let Him deal with you and let Him walk with you. Now, Nathan says here, he says, the Lord has also has put away your sin. David says, it's against God I've sinned. And only God can wash you. Only God can cleanse you. Only God can break the power of sin and, and, that, and that chain of iniquity in your life. Back to chapter 21. You guys probably thought I forgot. These mighty men of David. So Joab knows all the little dirty secrets of David. 
And he stays, Lord, he's crazy. He does a lot of crazy things. That's a whole sermon on Joab. Having people around you who may not always always be there for your best. You know, him and his brothers, they're like, they, they love David and they're really committed. But sometimes their methods for supporting David are not exactly what is God honoring. And sometimes you have people like that in your life. And over and over, when the brothers of, of Joab, when they come to David, and, and I can't go into that now because I don't have enough time. But David's always like, what do I have to do with you? What is stop being stupid? Like, like David always has to constantly put them into their place. But here back in, in, so we have the, the war against the Philistines and the, all the mighty men. They tell David, they tell David that, because the king is kind of old now, that this phase of life that God has you in, you don't need to go out to war with us because you get killed, we'll all be depressed. I was thinking like, huh, what would happen? Maybe I should not come to Cross Coast today and I just make an announcement, hey, I just got killed in the car. And then like I peek into the window and see how many people were crying. <laughs> Okay, you guys don't think that's funny, huh? Okay, I thought it was really funny as I was preparing for the sermon. I was like, <laughs> that would be really funny. Uh, but, okay, that's maybe not funny. Um, but, uh, but, but in the war, they see that David has now become a liability. And the Philistines, and all the enemies would want to destroy David. And so they tell him, don't come out with us. We'll take care of it. And the rest of that passage is how the other mighty men, so in verse 18... After, after this, there was war uh, again war with the Philistines at Gog. Then uh, Sibekai, the uh, Hushathite, struck down Seth, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gog. And Elhanan, the son of Jareh, or again, the Bethlehemite, struck down Go uh, Goliath, the Gittite. So it's another Goliath, not the same Goliath, another Goliath. And by this, these men who supported David, who were there with him, they were... These, when, when Saul was hunting David, these were the mighty men who were out there with David. When Absalom, his son, God said that the, the violence would not be the family. And David had to endure that fact that his son rose up against him and was really popular. And David had to flee from Jerusalem. And the men who leave with him, these are the mighty men. They do not leave David's side. They follow David when Saul's uh, uh, trying to kill him. They follow David when he's out there and Absalom is trying to kill him. They follow David to every war. They're committed to the team and they're committed to the cause and they're committed to the village, to the vision. Because no leader can ever lead unless there are people who are committed to the vision, committed to the cause. Together, even though you may have a leader that stands sort of in the front front, in the forefront, it just does not happen unless we're all committed on the same page to achieve the same goal. Because when the mighty men are together with David, it does not matter how tall the giants are, the giants fall. When the mighty men are with David, it does not matter even when the rebellion happens in his own household. It does not matter because with the mighty men, David goes out and he says that when Absalom's troops go and attack David, they, 20,000, bam! Like they can't, and, and then they're like, listen, you know, the people with David, he's got the mighty men with him. He's got the valiant ones. And, and, and if we go on and fight against them, mm, and, and their spirit, the spirit of the enemy is broken in the face of the team. And it's not just about David, but it's about the team and the type of leadership and the type of dedication. That even though David fails God, God never fails David. So what does this mean for us? That's a little overview of a few points from David's life. Yeah. We, are, we are a group of people. We are committed to a vision of creating a group, a community of disciples, people who follow Jesus Christ with all their heart, mind, and soul, people who have been redeemed by We know that we have sinned against God. We know that we do not deserve His grace. We do not deserve a place in paradise. But we know that God has given us forgiveness. And we know that His Son, who died upon the cross for us, our sins were paid for on the cross. And three days later, Jesus Christ arises from the grave. We have been set free. We all know that. That's the basis for our community. It's a group of people who have been redeemed by God, who have been set free by God, who have been forgiven by God. And now in the power of His forgiveness, in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we form a community across cultural lines, across ethnic lines, across generational lines, across educational lines. Because we believe that in Christ, with Christ as a sinner, any group of people can come together to become God's people. 
And we want to demonstrate that in Uppsala. We want to live that out in Uppsala. And so we formed this group, Cross Culture, out of a desire to see a living, dynamic church actually grow up. A, a place where people would be trained and encouraged and inspired to share their faith, to go out like the mighty men of David. And even when the whole world around us says that this is no longer true, we don't stand for it, we're like, it's okay, we still go out. We, we don't care how far the water is, we'll breathe, we'll breach through to bring the water that is needed. And we don't abandon each other. And we don't leave people out there to do it on their own. Because we believe in community. A community that's inspired by what God does inside of our lives as individuals and our families and our homes and what he does to us in the community. Now, I, I may be your, your pastor, and, and many of you guys who've known me for a long time should know by now that I am not a perfect person. If you want a perfect pastor, you have to pick someone else. If you want someone who is always going to say the right things and be super kind to everyone, you, you need to pick someone else. But I am committed to our cause that which is cross-culture, I've committed to us as a leadership team, us and me and then the board. i committed to us as individuals to see us to grow, to see us become true, mature disciples of Jesus Christ. So that any person who comes to who does not know Jesus can actually, in this community, in this place, can get to know Jesus personally, can get to know God personally, can experience God's forgiveness, can experience God's grace, can experience that I too have been included in God's love. He didn't forget about me. He didn't die just for Anna Carter and Yusuf, but he died for me too. And he includes me in that love and invites me in to be a part of his family and asks me to repent and to trust him and to walk with him. But I cannot do it by myself, you guys. Petra can't do it by herself. As good a chairman of the board she is, she cannot do it by herself. And I don't want to see any of us get burnt out. I don't want to see any of us lose our joy in serving God. I don't want to see any of us becoming bitter. No! I want us to think that what we do together is to serve the living God. It's to make His name great. It's to, it's to exalt Jesus in the world around us through the way in which we live together, the way in which we worship together, the way in which we pray together. But in order to do that, we all need to be on the same page. We all need to be committed to this cause if we're going to do this together. And I know that both Petra and myself need help from everybody. And some of you guys have been standing up for a long time. People like Ratchetar, who's been coming here, I don't know how many years, you know. Uh -huh. Laurie, who's been, he just got back from Finland, and he gave me a hug today. So I figured, like, woo, uh -huh. things are happening now. Things are getting hot here, you know. Uh -huh. John, who's, who's over here with his wife, wife Lorena, John was like one of his original founders. So you guys get to touch him and say, woo. You're one of the original founders of cross culture. <laughs> Maybe some of the anointment will rub off of you, you know. But there's some of us who've been here, and some of us have been new. Benjamin hasn't been here that long. Jonathan hasn't been here that long. Jonathan and Ruth, but they step up and they help out because this is what real community in God is like. It's messy, you guys. It's full of Davids. It's full of mighty men. It's full of Joabs. But in that brokenness. There's a God who binds us together. There's the Holy Spirit that God gives us that speaks and moves and washes through us and leads us to become more and more like Jesus. And that brokenness, that imperfection that's called culture. I don't think we've ever had one service that was totally perfect from start to finish, time-wise, speech-wise, technical-wise. I don't think that ever, have ever happened in nine years. But in that brokenness, I think that maybe many of us have discovered something about God and maybe hopefully have grown and hopefully we'll keep on growing. In that when we get to the end of our life. Let us get there. Not just because I'm almost there, but let us get there. Praising God just as much today as tomorrow. Worshiping God and thanking Him for all the goodness that He's done. Trusting God and encouraging each other to not give into temptation, but to go beyond that. And when we fall, let's pick each other up. Let's speak the truth to each other in love. And sometimes the truth is hard to hear. I know it's hard for me to hear. Sometimes I just want to run away, hide my head in the sand, cry. But the truth has to be told. And the truth has to be received if we're ever going to experience God's greatness and goodness among us. But when we do that as a team, 
maybe in this town of Uppsala, maybe some of the people who we've never thought to be saved become saved and they become believers. Maybe some people actually really come from death to life. Is that worth it? Is that worth it? That each of us get a chance to experience it. The end of David's life. Go and read that last words of David. Read the last song that he writes, which is, I think it's almost the same as Psalm 18. And one of those things David says that, I can run against the, by my God, I can run against the truth. By my God, I can leap over walls. By God, you guys. Cross culture has always been by God, for God, about God. 